Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Jesus. We thank You for His life. We thank You for His love. We thank You for His hope and we thank You for His joy. And we thank You for this opportunity we now have to gather as Your people, to centre our eyes on the good news of Jesus. And it's in the mighty Name of Jesus that we pray and all of God's people said with one super loud voice. Amen. Amen. Welcome City on a Hill. My name's Steph. And my name's Guy. And it's fantastic to be gathered together today as we continue in our series in 1 Corinthians and as we lift our eyes to the good news of Jesus. Good news indeed. And speaking of good news, a lot of restrictions across Australia are beginning to lift. It makes me wonder, Steph, what is it that you're enjoying most right now? Oh, well, for me, that image of the red tape around playgrounds was just the saddest image of COVID. I've got a three-year-old boy and that was a sad image for us. So to see the tape off, the playgrounds open, to be able to play on those has just been amazing. Uh, What about you, Guy? Well, I am counting down the days until the AFL season (laughs) kicks back again. I'm a Melbourne supporter and so I'm looking forward to seeing the red legs run onto the MCG, play another game and probably lose again. So two different type of playgrounds then. You there it is. Play down, slide and football. <laughs> uh, well, City on a Hill, we want to know what it is for you. So if there is something that you've been enjoying over this last week, uh, let us know. Fill in the comments uh, what it is that you've been excited about over this last week. And uh, for those of you who are new, perhaps you're gathering with us, you're joining us today online for the first time. Perhaps you've been joining us for a couple of weeks now. We still feel new and you'd love to know more about the vision and the mission of City on a Hill. We'd love to invite you to one of our newcomers events a wonderful opportunity to meet some of the the leadership team here at city on a hill to meet other people who are new and to do that journey together to hear how about how you can be involved uh, sms connect to 0481072237 uh, we're so thankful for the many men and women over this time who've been incredibly generous and mm. giving generously so that we can lift Absolutely. up the name of jesus uh, if you are a regular a member of City on a Hill, we'd love to invite and encourage you uh, to give generously that we might continue to go forth in this mission, great mission that we have of knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. You can head to cityonahill.digital and click give. And families, of course, remember uh, to head with your children uh, to CKTV yeah. as we uh, hear more and our, our kids are able to hear more about uh, Jesus uh, in that time as well. Absolutely. Today, Steph, City on a Hill, we are continuing our series in 1 Corinthians with this three-part mini-series on sex, marriage, and singleness. So thankful for how uh, God's people have been engaging in God's Word. I really want to thank you for the, for the encouragement and, and yeah. hearing how God's working in in your life. Uh, 
Today, we're joined by good mate, pastor of City on a Hill, Geelong, Andrew Grills. So very thankful for him and so looking forward to his word where we're looking at the back end of 1 Corinthians 7 with a particular message that's addressed to those who are single and unmarried. Before we hear from the Bible reading, we're going to hear from some men and women from City on a Hill, Melbourne. Hey, City on a Hill, my name is Emily and I'm on team at City on a Hill, Melbourne. And this week we are talking about singleness. So I thought that I would have a conversation with my gospel community. This is them. This is the North Melbourne gospel community. Hey. Um, they are fantastic. And so instead of me just talking to you guys for five minutes straight, I thought I would invite them into the conversation and hear some of the wisdom from them as well. So what I've done is I have given a few of them questions to ask, and they're just going to ask different people in the group who will hopefully have an answer for them. Uh, so we're going to we're gonna do that and I'm going to see how it goes. So I'm going to throw it to Mike and Kate first. So Kendall, this question's for you. Hey. What do you enjoy about being single? Uh, so like, while singleness like, certainly can be tough sometimes, there's a couple of big things that I really appreciated about it the past couple uh, few years. Um, so I think firstly, um, it's really helped with um, kind of really trying to follow the kind of direction that I feel God has been leading me in and moving around a lot kind of the past few years to pursue study and all sorts of other things. Um, but the other thing that I've really enjoyed is kind of being able to get a, a peek into all of my kind of friends and my friends that have gotten married and have kids and get a peek into what their lives are like at different mm. stages of life. And like, I've got four like nieces and nephews. So that's, you know, it's, it's fun. It's fun being an uncle. Like, there's, um, I, I do enjoy it. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Curtis, I think I gave you a question too, right? Yep. This question is directed to Ben and Ash. And the question is, how do you intentionally love your single friends? Um, I think something for us that um, we try to do is be present. So um, when we go and hang out with a group of friends, um, it's that we're not in each other's pockets and that we're um, present with the people that are really important in our lives um, and their relationships with us matter just as much. Um, so I think definitely, um, yeah, I guess trying to um, build our relationships with them along with one another. Yeah, Ash and I tend not to really uh, identify our friends as being uh, single or non-single. Um, we try and treat our friends equally, I guess. Um, but th I think there is a trend among like couples or married people that um, mm -hmm. they tend to yeah, like withdraw or retreat into themselves or isolate themselves from their friends. And it's not really, um, it's not intentional, I think, but when you're married, uh, it's easier. Your relationship needs to be satisfied, so you, you tend to neglect uh, your friends. So being mindful of that uh, and still investing your time and your energy and being available uh, for them, I think is, uh, mm. is important and something that we try our best to do. Try. Yeah. try. And something I've been really thankful for you guys. I think you guys do that really well. Same with Mike and Kate. Um, and our whole group could probably like testament to that. I'm really thankful for you guys and yeah, the way that you have intentionally loved me, um, but also loved each of us, I think has been, yeah, really cool. Yeah. Um, the last question is directed to you, Em. What's something you wish you knew two years ago about being single? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, I was turning 29. Oof and i was staring down the barrel of 30 and i was like oh my gosh like my life doesn't look how i thought it would um and i think what i would now tell my then self is how hey, you're gonna be okay um and you're going to be okay but not because your life looks a certain way um but because jesus is better um and i i i, I think i tried to really trust that then but i think um i could have trusted that harder, uh, better, more intentionally. Um, and so I think, yeah, being able to truly declare that Jesus is better, no matter what my look, my life looks like, um, is what I would tell my 29 year old self. Um, and I, I also think that that would be true if I was married. Um, I would like to think that I would still say that Jesus is better. Um, and so, 
yeah, thinking that through and what that looks like, I I know that there are great joys and there are great griefs uh, within singleness, but doing them and knowing that I'm okay, knowing that I can go visit my kids, my my kids, my friends' kids, um, and like meet them when they're born, and knowing that I can do that for no matter what time of day it is. And, um, like Kendall said, like it's fun to be able to go and be in my friends' lives, see their kids, and that's really special to me. Um, and I'm thankful that that isn't something that's changed and that's something that I get to do um, now, maybe more intentionally, um, being single and knowing that I can just jump in my car and go. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I tell myself, that is what I tell my friends, and hopefully that is encouraging for you guys as our gospel community, um, but also for everyone at home um, who's tuning in. Uh, Look out for your single friends. If you're single, be intentional in the friendships that you have um, and just continue to trust that Jesus is better. And no matter what, trust that that is true because it definitely is. Um, and to be able to help you trust that more, uh, Pastor Andrew Grills is going to preach for us here in a few minutes. Uh, so why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 um, as we continue in our Bible reading there. One Corinthians chapter seven verses twenty five to forty. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I will spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they have no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and in spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry, it is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the spirit of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our culture seems to have a contradictory view on the topic of singleness. On one hand, we're told that the single years are the best years. Have fun, make hay while the sun shines, sow your wild oats. Uh, if you want to, game all night. 
or perhaps better, work on your career, put some serious hours into establishing yourself. But whatever you do, don't get caught into the chains of a serious relationship. On the other hand, there's the view that marriage is, that singleness is a problem that you need to solve. You're in a holding pattern, waiting for the person, the one soulmate who will complete you and satisfy you and bring you the fulfillment and joy that you long for. Two very different views. It's probably fair to say that guys gravitate towards the first and many women gravitate towards the second. But what they both have in common is the view that singleness is a temporary stage of immaturity. It either ends reluctantly or willingly when you are married or something very similar to it, a long-term relationship. But today I want to ask the question, what does God think about singleness? Because these verses that we've looked at today are God's most clear teaching on singleness. The Apostle Paul at this stage in the letter to Corinthians has been answering some questions that they've been asking him. Questions about sex and marriage and singleness. The challenge for us, though, is that we don't have the letter with the questions that they're asking. We're just hearing Paul's responses. So it's a little bit like um, listening to one side of a telephone conversation. But we get a pretty good idea of the questions they're asking, and we know for certain that the topic that was concerning them was clearly singleness. And what Paul has to say was as radical then as it is to us now. Now, I know that as we look at this topic of singleness, you'll be asking yourself some questions. You'll be thinking, "Um, Andrew, how long have you been married now? The answer would be 21 years, actually. And how old were you when you got married? Uh, I was 25, just turned 25, and my wife, Dana, had just turned 20. And you think, well, so you're here today to speak to us about singleness? Fair point. I also recognize as I begin that singleness is a catch-all term which refers to many different situations which people can experience. Uh, Vaughan Roberts is a former pastor of mine and a good friend. In fact, he married Dana and I uh, in the last millennium. And Vaughan's a single man and he says about singleness that there are age, circumstantial and experiential differences in singleness. So in regards to age, he says being single at the age of 20 is radically different from being single at 30 or 50 or 70. Circumstantially, uh, some have never married. Some have divorced and others are single because their spouse has died. And perhaps most importantly, there are experiential differences. Some have chosen to be single and are basically content. Others have not chosen to be single, long to be married, and are frustrated that they're not. Now, I know that there are people listening right now in all of those different situations. And I can't pretend to know what it is that this topic brings up in you. That's why me coming today and giving Andrew's top tips on singleness would not only be silly, it'd be patronising. And so today when I come, I want to come with, if you like, a basket. And I want to come and bring to you a basket. And in that basket, there is only one thing. In that basket is the word of God. And I want to invite you that as I bring that basket of God's word, that you would look inside it and that you would take and find in that basket of God's word, a word to you. A word that comes with love. It speaks not just to your mind, but to your deepest needs of your heart. And if you're married today, please don't think this is the week off for you. Uh, Firstly, because if you're married like me, the truth is that many of us at one time in our lives will be single again. Perhaps because our marriages will tragically fail. Or perhaps because our Spouses will die before we do. But also, and perhaps more importantly, this is not a week for marriage to turn off because we as a church are a family. We are made up of many people in many different situations and everybody matters. Everybody is part of the family. 
We're told that roughly 30 to 35% of the Australian adult church is single. So those of us who are married have the obligation and the ability to care and nurture singleness, singles, and especially in God's word to them. So let's come now to the Bible, to God's word. Chapter 7, verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed. The word translated betrothed in the Greek is the word parthenoi, and it means virgin or sometimes young women. We can't be sure if this is referring here to young women who are betrothed, like engaged to be married, or young women who are thinking about being married. All we know is that these people addressed are not yet married. And Paul then continues, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Uh, This doesn't mean that Paul is saying, look, um, this is my opinion and you can kind of take it or leave it. What it means when he says, he says this is that, look, Jesus didn't speak specifically to this, this issue, but I, as his commissioned and sent apostle, am now going to speak into this situation which you are facing. And that's exactly what he does in verse 26. Listen to this. I think that in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. Well, what was the present distress? Uh, some people believe that he was referring to a famine which occurred around the time the letter was written or maybe a pandemic. Others believe that this present distress refers to persecution that was taking place in Corinth or or maybe that persecution which Christians face down through the ages. We, We can't know exactly, but we do see that Paul quite radically counsels single people to remain as they are. That's single. Wow. I wonder if you're a single person, that corresponds to your experience in church. Now, there can be no doubt that marriage is celebrated as a wonderful gift from God in Scripture. But the Bible here clearly is lifting up singleness as something also to be celebrated as a blessing and a gift from God. Now, in uh, pastoring those who are single, I've often heard from them that churches are geared around married people and that many married people seem to have their sole ambition in life is to get the singles within the church community married, get the problem solved. And I, myself and my wife, have been guilty of this. Uh, I mentioned my good friend Vaughan. Um, We delighted in setting up incredibly awkward and painful dinner engagements where he would show up with one single lovely lady and, and we weren't even subtle about what we were trying to do. We had a good time doing that. But looking back, I realized that what we were doing unconsciously perhaps was universalizing the good gift of marriage, which we're enjoying and applying it to everybody as the state of play, which everyone should experience. Uh, When we do this, we actually miss the supreme irony of what the Bible teaches on singleness and the supreme irony of the most fulfilled and godly person, the one who lived the most joyous life, Jesus himself, who of course was single. Uh, Vaughan himself uh, tells, which, which makes me cringe even more, of uh, his conversation with a popular, a well-known pastor and evangelist, uh, John Chapman. And he, John Chapman, spoke of Christian's friends constantly taking him for long walks and telling him that he should be married. And he comments and says, it would have been a great help if they had read the Bible, wouldn't it? And that's the point, isn't it? That is the point that we're looking at. The Bible insists that singleness is not a problem to be solved. Rather, singleness, like marriage, is a gift to be enjoyed. He goes on in verse 7 to say, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul says he wishes that everyone was single like him, but each one's got his own gift from God. But what does he mean when he says singleness is a gift? Well, a few weeks ago, I was checking in uh, with a woman in our church named Ruth. Uh, Ruth is a single woman. She's in her 50s. She lives alone. And I asked how she was doing in this whole COVID-19 isolation. She said this, At the start, it was very difficult. 
I struggled with being stuck home, but then I came to see it as a gift from God to me. Since then, my attitude has changed and I've started embracing and making the most of the gift, she says. She was not saying that COVID-19 was a, a gift, but she was saying that the isolation that it brought was. Now, this struck me for several reasons. Firstly, because I've tended to be one of the people who have been quite miserable about this isolation experience and what it's taken from me. But it also struck me because there's actually a very clear parallel here with what Paul's teaching about the gift of marriage. Vaughan Roberts, again, he puts it so well. Listen to what he says. A few consciously choose to stay single to devote themselves to Christian work. Most single people haven't chosen singleness in that way. And yet they have the same advantages as those who have. Instead of focusing on the difficulties of being single, as some do, we should all make the most of the advantages of God's gift of singleness while we have it. Like Vaughan, Ruth herself could have, been, could have chosen to be in a married type relationship. She was not voluntarily single. But she knew that in her case, moving in that direction would be to break the commandments of a good and loving God to her. And so because she loves God more than any other person, she chooses to receive the gift of singleness and to embrace it. People like Vaughan and Ruth who do not choose to be single are people who shine very brightly the truth about Jesus Christ, which they embody. And according to Paul, um, singleness has some very powerful advantages in its favor. What are these advantages? Well, Paul lists three big ones. He says, firstly, for those in Corinth, the present situation, what, whatever that was, means that it's advantageous for them to stay single. Why? Well, because being single in a crisis is actually considerably easier. Um, I think actually about the recent COVID-19 trials, which we've all been experiencing, which has changed our world. It's actually very interesting to me that on the final Sunday before lockdown, when we were still able to meet as a church community, I was very interested to look at the statistics of who came to that final church meeting in our church building in Geelong. Now, um, the morning services were full of elderly single people in droves, actually. The evening services were packed with young singles in their 20s and 30s. Who was missing en masse? It was actually the people who, according to the experts, were the very least at risk of contracting or suffering grave harm from coronavirus. Young families with children. In a similar way, uh, I've spoken with a number of people married and single in our church who have tragically lost their jobs. Now, losing your, your job is always a stressful and, um, and a horrible experience. But it's interesting to me that the single people have generally taken it much better than the married people, especially the married people who are single income families with children. Why? Because just quite simply, being married brings with it extra financial and, and anxiety responsibilities that come, which single people don't experience in that same manner. And Paul says, so it's better given this time to, to be single. You'll, you'll save yourself from that. But Paul also says that marriage itself brings its own troubles. He puts it in very stark terms in, in verse 28. Listen, listen to what he says. He says, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Can I uh, get an amen from married people? But hey, hey, if you're sitting next to your wife or your husband, please do it silently. But he's right, isn't he? Marriage brings its own unique difficulties and troubles. troubles. When I'm doing marriage counseling with, with pre-marriage couples looking forward to their marriage, I nearly always say to them, do you know that the person who is holding your hand and looking lovingly into your eyes is the very same person that one day you will wake up and wish that you had never married? They nod and kind of think, well, he's a pretty bit extreme, but yeah, I'm, I suppose that's right. But I know they don't believe me, but it's the truth. It's nearly always the truth. Even the happiest of marriages comes with griefs and struggles. 
I would consider myself happily married now for 21 years, but let me tell you, I and my wife are not always happy being married. Marriage is not just a legal contract and a few signatures that can be done in just a few minutes. Marriage is as a lifelong commitment and requires so much work to make it fruitful. Two sinful people living together, grading on each other. It's hard work. Uh, many times in my time as a pastor, I'll, I'll recommend marriage couples, married couples to get some counseling to help them in this. In fact, right now, Dana and I are getting some counseling from a marriage counselor to help us improve in this. It's difficult. But the truth is that many marriages and many Christian marriages are not happy marriages. Marriage can bring terrible grief and pain. Brett, uh, a single woman on staff at Sierra Hill, Melbourne, has these very perceptive words. She's looking in on marriage and she says this, Paul's not anti-romance, but he is being a realist. Marriage, like singleness, has its ups and downs and the downs in marriage are significant. Yeah, we don't often acknowledge this. Instead, when thinking about marriage and singleness, we frequently compare the best moments of marriage with the worst of singleness. I do this often. I compare the joy of my friend on her wedding day with the deep ache of sadness I feel watching from the singles table. I compare the cute Instagram photos of my friend's date night or family holiday with my moments of loneliness. In doing these comparisons, we set marriage up as the indisputably better option and the cure to the problems faced in single life. But the truth is that marriage is not the cure. For I've seen in the lives of people that I love that marriage brings its own problems, which can be far more agonizing than the trials of singleness. Now, Britt speaks as a single person, but those of us who are married can say a silent amen to the wisdom embodied in her words. Paul says, I'd like to spare you that. Then he gives a second reason singleness is the better option. And to look at that reason, I'd like you to come again with me to verses 29 to 31. I'm going to read them because this is very significant. Listen to what he says. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now, what's Paul saying here? Is he saying that married people should take off their rings and pretend that they're single? No, that would be unhelpful. His point actually is summed up in that last sentence. He says, for the present form of this world is passing away. Marriage, Paul says, is a temporary thing. It belongs in this world, which is passing away. And actually, it's insignificant when compared to the vast scope of the reality of eternity. Now, for married people, this is a challenge. We, we marry, we build homes, we, we, we love to, to put families in those homes. These are good things. But for those of us who experience largely a happy marriage, if we come to deeply love our spouse and we settle comfortably down, then we run severe spiritual danger. Paul is saying that, that marriage, like the other things he mentions, like money and possessions, are good gifts from God. But these very same gifts, if we're not careful, can become spiritual weights that sink us. Now, I know that sounds strong. I so, say, Andrew, you're dishing out of marriage. I'm not. Marriage is something that's celebrated in Scripture. But Paul's point here is that marriage can deaden your heart. Jesus himself pulls no punches here. Jesus, in two of his specific parables, the great banquet in Luke 14 and the coming of the Son of Man in Luke 17, says that for those who are married in those parables, marriage was a reason for them not to follow Jesus. Marriage was the reason that they will not be in eternity. Marriage is a good gift, but like any good gift, it can become idolatrous if we put, in the, put it in the place of the God who made us and 
loves us. Married people need to remember that the time is short and it's soon passing away. There's only one bride and groom in heaven and that is Christ and his church. Paul says, singleness is better because you will not experience those temptations in the same way. Which leads to Paul's final point. Now, Paul suggests that it's easy to serve God wholeheartedly as a single person and to receive the wonderful joy and satisfaction that that brings. Paul's speaking here about the reality that to be married means that you give yourself to another person. You must now share their interests. That You must serve their interests. It's, it's inherent in the good gift of marriage that God gives. But it also means, he says, that married people can no longer be devoted with the same full intensity and undivided attention that a single person has. And that's true in terms of freedom, isn't it? A single person could potentially hear a call from God to, to go and serve God in another Africa, let's say, and be on, the, be on the plane at the end of the week. A married person can't do that. A single person could hear of a friend who, who is going through dreadful suffering and could drop everything maybe and be at that friend's side. For married people, it is not that simple. But it's also true at the heart level. Meg Dale uh, works full-time in professional theatre, or she did until COVID-19 took her job. At the moment, she's serving a full-time volunteer on staff with us in Geelong. Med's awesome. We love her. She is a single woman. And she told me a few weeks ago of a vision that she said God gave her about her singleness. She described it like this, that God is like a master artist, painting masterpiece after masterpiece and graciously giving them away to be loved by someone else. But then he says, sometimes he chooses to hang one of those masterpieces on his own wall. Just for his enjoyment. Just for his pleasure. Singleness can be like that. The single person can be devoted to the Lord with a wholehearted intensity that a married person cannot be in the same way. There's a spiritual beauty in the gift of singleness, which is truly Wonderful. And Paul says, look, I wish that everyone could be like me and have that gift and embrace it. So Paul concludes his commands or his, his, his recommendations about singleness in verse 35 by talking to those who were divorced or widowed and saying to them, look, you know, you're free to get married if you want to, but I think you'd be better off staying single, giving your undivided attention and focus to the Lord. So this is God's word most clearly explained of anywhere in the Bible addressing the topic of singleness. Now, it's not what his original hearers would have expected to hear, and it's certainly not we what we would expect to hear today. It's radical. It's radically countercultural. Marriage is a good gift from God. Singleness is a good gift from God. But if you've got to say one's better than the other, singleness is better. Now, I know that this evokes all sorts of different responses. Some people would say, you're just trying to make me feel better about my singleness. I'm not. Remember, I'm bringing the basket of God's word to you and asking that you would see in it God's good gift to you. But I want to close by thinking directly about some of the practical applications of this. I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but there's a few ones that I think would be very helpful. Firstly, singleness may be better but it is difficult. Even for those who voluntarily choose singleness, singleness is difficult. It's tough. Maybe today you're a person who hasn't voluntarily chosen singleness and you feel the ache and the loss involved in that. Maybe you're a person who, who is aging. You'd long to be married but you feel that the age in which you could be married and potentially have, have children is passing or is past. And that brings grief to you. What do you do with that? Just say, no, it's a gift. It's a gift. That's not what God calls us to be. God calls us to be real. And if you're someone today that this stirs up emotions and you feel that loss and that grief and that pain, the last thing you want to do 
is force a smile and pretend to be happy. Come to God with your tears. He made you. He loves you. He wants you to be real with him. So be real with him and acknowledge the grief. Acknowledge the sorrow of some things that you would like, which for now may not be given to you. God welcomes your tears. Pour them out to him. It's a great missionary, um, single woman, wrote a lot of hymns as well by the name of Margaret Clarkson. When she was in her mid-60s, she wrote these words. They're, they're wonderful, but true words. She said, Multitudes of single Christians of every age and circumstance have proved God's sufficiency in singleness. He has promised to meet our needs and he honors his word. If we seek fulfillment in him, we shall find it. It may not be easy, but whoever said the Christian life is easy? The badge of Christ's discipleship was a cross. Singleness is tough. Secondly, while it's tough, while it can be difficult, make the most of the gift while you have it. It is a gift. Brit, who I quoted before, has this to add about how we can do that. She says this, Singleness is often described like purgatory. Since marriage is assumed to be the only viable option for adult life, we come to expect it will happen. And so to be single, particularly for women, is often to see yourselves as just waiting for marriage. A helpful little book called Bus Stops and Bicycles likens singleness to feeling like you're waiting at the bus stop for the bus to take you to your real adult life. And the message of the book is to stop waiting, instead to get on your bike and ride to where you want to go. It's simple, but good advice that I recommend, she says. So single, get on your gospel bike, get on your Jesus empowered bike and ride. Make the most of the gift that you've got. Pour yourself out for him. Pour yourself out for others. There, there's nothing better than the single life lived joyously in relationship with God. You say, oh, how, how, do you, how do you know that, Andrew? I don't know it, but I know that our Lord and Savior Jesus was a single man. And he knows that firsthand. Get on your bike. Thirdly, watch out for selfishness. And I'll speak to married people here first. Single people have a huge and disproportionate impact on our churches. They are disproportionately serving and giving in a way that benefits every single person in the church, including the married people and the children. Single people play a huge role, and not just because they babysit our kids. But singles in the body of Christ need you too. It's easy once you become married and you have a family to live in your little bubble, yourself contained emotionally and relationally. But singles want to be invited in. Uh, over the years, we've made the choice as a family to invite singles to come on holidays with us, single friends at church. And it's been a wonderful experience because uh, for us, we get the benefit of their company. We get the impact um, or their, their, their input into the lives of our kids. And for singles, sometimes holidays can be a lonely time. So they get some company and companionship on holidays. And, and best of all, maybe for them, they get reminded of how wonderful singles is after hanging out with a family of seven for a few weeks. But as, as married people, that's something we can do. Singles may not want to, but we should at least invite them into our families and into our little bubbles. But singleness, singles are not immune uh, to the dangers of selfishness either. The great preacher and writer John Stott, who chose to be single throughout his life, he said these words about his own experience of singleness. He said, apart from sexual temptation, the greatest danger which I think we face as singles is self-centeredness. We may live alone and have total freedom to plan our own schedule with nobody else to modify it or even give us advice. If we are not careful, we may find the whole world revolving around ourselves. If you're married and particularly if you've got children, you'll know that marriage and children grind away at your selfishness. 
everything you want to do is, seems to be subservient to what needs to be done for them. Singles don't have this forced on them, but, but singles, John Stott would say, should embrace the community, should be seeking to put themselves in positions of inconvenience to serve and to give and to love. But the time is short and whether we're married or singles, we're called to live out the, the life that our Lord Jesus calls us to, a life poured out for others. But finally, and this is surely the biggest one, I think, remember the truth which is yours. What was the devil's first lie to Eve in the Garden of Eden? It was this. Did God really say, don't eat from that tree? Did God really say, oh, no, 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 no. He, he doesn't want you to have the knowledge of good and evil. What's the heart of the lie that he told them? The heart of the lie that he told them is that God can't be trusted. He can't be trusted to give you what you really need. He can't be trusted to give you the happiness and the fulfillment that you long for. He can't be trusted. He can't be trusted to have your interests first. He can't be trusted to make you happy. You're missing out. That was the first and greatest lie. And it continues to be the lie that the world and sometimes the church trumpets at singles. The lie that God can't be trusted and you're missing out. One single woman, Jocelyn Bignall, wrote this. The trajectory of our culture would have us, would have us on, centers on romance. In a story polished to a fine gleam by Disney, pop music and the rolling fairy tale of our Instagram feed, we're told that the destination we are all heading for and the only thing that will complete us is our soulmate. Marriage, she says, in this narrative is an idol. God can't be trusted to bring you the fulfillment that you need. Marriage can God can't be trusted to care for your happiness. Marriage will. This other person will fulfill me and complete me. It's idolatry. It's, it's believing the great lie that someone or something beside God will really truly fulfill us. And like all idolatry, not only is it misguided and empty, but it will enchain us and enslave us. Why is it that some Christians choose to marry non-Christian people? Is it because they, they've never been told about what the Bible teaches in passages like this? About marrying only another Christian? No, or well, very rarely no. It's because in their hearts, men and women believe that in another person, they will find what God cannot give them. That's the great lie. The devil came to steal and kill and destroy. And nowhere does he do it more so than in the propagation of that lie. But what's the great truth? What is the great truth that we must believe whether we're married or we're single? The great truth is this. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it to the full. I came that they might have joy and have it abundantly. The truth that we must hold on to, the great truth is this. Jesus can be trusted. He can be trusted to give you what you hunger for. He can be trusted to fulfill the deepest needs that you have. Jesus knows what lies deep in your heart. He knows the longings. He made you and he can be trusted. And the truth is that each of us, married and single, is heading towards a wedding. Not the wedding of a man and a woman in the winter time of this world, two sinful people thrown together, but the marriage in the springtime of eternity that will last forever. The marriage of Jesus Christ and his bride. And you are invited to that marriage, that marriage ceremony, whether you are married or single. God can be trusted. He's the ultimate reality of which the idolatry of marriage is simply a counterfeit and a camouflage. Jesus looks at me as a married person. And he says, 
Marriage is my gift to you. Honor me in it, but it will not fulfill you. Jesus looks at you maybe as a single person and he says, singleness is my gift to you. Honor me in it, but it will not fulfill you. Jesus said these words, John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. I'm the bread in that basket presented to you. I am the bread of life, he says. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Friends, married and single, this is the truth we need to hear. Jesus is better. Jesus can be trusted. Jesus made us and loves us and knows us. And he will fulfill us. He'll fulfill us now. And he will fill us in all of eternity on that day when we enter the wedding supper of the Lamb and we begin the eternal feast that will never end when the Lord Jesus will look to his faithful servants who, whether married or single, walk the road that he called them and will say, well done, my good and my faithful servants. Come into the kingdom prepared for you before the beginning of the world. In a world with so many lies, Believe and trust in the truth of Jesus Christ. The one who has gone before you and is calling you to the, to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Let me pray. Father, we come to this topic and we know that it can be sensitive and painful. So we pray, Lord, that we would feast from the basket of your gift to us, of your word. Jesus, you're the bread of life. Only you can fulfill us. Help us, Lord, to listen and trust in you, to shut our ears to the call of the world and those around us. And help us, Lord, to be men and women, married and single, who model the truth that Jesus Christ is enough for us. That's in his name that we pray. Amen.
sing a little louder in the presence of my enemy sing a little louder louder than the unbelief sing a little louder my weapon is a melody sing a little louder heaven comes to fight for me
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You that You are high, that You are lifted up. Thank You that You are a God of love and of great mercy. Thank You most of all for Jesus, the Lamb of God. We thank You that He died for us and that in Him our souls can be satisfied. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that today that You might gift us with faith that we might know that joy, that we might know the fullness and the joy of Jesus. And it's in His powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, City on a Hill, for tuning in uh, for City on a Hill Digital. Uh, And a big, big thanks to Pastor Andrew Grills for such an encouraging message, reminding us of the good news of the gospel. Let's thank Andrew right now, wherever you are. Why don't you, I don't know, share the the love and (laughs) post your favourite emoji, whatever it is. He's done an amazing, amazing talk. Yeah, it's great. And what an incredible vision of Jesus that we have seen today. Some of you are hungry to be satisfied, Mm. that you're hungry to know joy and meaning and life. And today, Jesus says to you, come. He invites you to come to Him. And if that is you, I want to encourage you today to say yes to Jesus, to come to Jesus. I want to encourage you and invite you uh, to SMS. Pray to 0481072237 so that you can do that journey of following Jesus with others. Uh, Some of you know Jesus, uh, but your heart is heavy to know the fullness of Jesus' love today. And I want to encourage you and invite you, if that is you, uh, to SMS pray to 0481072237. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, we'd love you to come along to a newcomer's night. Uh, make sure you let us know if you'd love to come, come along to that. Absolutely. And next week, we'll be continuing 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapters 8 and 9. We'd love you to tune in with us then. Until then... Friends of City on Hill, City on Hill brothers and sisters, may the love of Jesus draw you to Himself. May the power of Jesus strengthen you in His service. May the joy of Jesus fill your heart. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.